my screen. Can everyone see that? Yes, okay, I'm seeing nods, okay. Uh, well, I want to um, uh, kick this off by welcoming everyone to the opening session of Open Repositories 2021. It's our 16th um, uh, conference. We're so pleased that everyone could be here. Um, if not in person, um, virtually is wonderful. We have a really exciting conference for you this year, and um, we're just uh, thrilled that so many people are um, going to be joining us. Um, I'm Sarah Shreves. I'm the chair of the Open Repositories Steering Committee um, and um, want to do this welcome. I'm going to just start with some brief logistical pieces. I'm also serving essentially as the host chair this year since we usually have a in-person institution, uh, we usually have somebody from that institution serving as host, but since we're virtual this year, I am serving as the host. Um, so I first just want to note our um, steering committee. This is your open repository steering committee. Um, these are the folks who spend all year doing the planning and work to um, pull off the, the conference. Um, alongside our program uh, chairs um, who become temporary members of the of the steering committee. Um, I want to note a couple of changes in our steering committee. Um, first, to note that we have two folks stepping down who have been longtime members, John Dunn and Yerki Ilva, who will be stepping down this year from the steering committee. Um, we want to thank them for their service and to um, wish them well um, as, as they go on. Um, they have both made enormous contributions to the conference and please excuse my beagle in the background. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I also am going to be stepping down as chair um, as of this conference, actually, this is my last conference as chair of the steering committee and Claire Knowles will be stepping into the chair role. Um, Torsten Reimer will be stepping in as our vice chair. Um, so you will have new leadership um, of the steering committee and we're really excited about that. This also means that we are going to have um, two new spaces for members. So um, I'm, we're gonna be putting out a call for new members on June 14th. Um, nominations will be due by July 30th um, and elections, the steering committee will select members in August and new members would join in September. So please watch for that announcement. Um, we will be uh, making that pretty much immediately after the conference. Um, and we look forward to, um, to seeing who applies. I also want to thank our sponsors um, for their contributions. Um, we had six sponsors this year. Uh, sponsorship of a conference, even a virtual conference has expenses. Um, and so this conference couldn't take place without our sponsors. Um, I really appreciate that um, this group of folks um, decided that even with the virtual conference, it was worth um, uh, supporting open repositories. Um, all of these folks have been supporters of, of OR. And so I really do want to appreciate, to, to state my appreciation. I also want to note that we will be having networking sessions um, on each day, on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. And you'll have a chance to talk to the um, to the sponsors within that session, and I'll be touching on that in a little bit. I also want to thank the organizations who provided technical and logistical support for the conference. We had um, a group of folks who basically volunteered Zoom, um, 
uh, and other hosting resources. Um, so thank you to all of these organizations who, um, without whom we couldn't have put on open repositories. We have um, the, the benefit of having a virtual conference is that we are getting an enormous spread of participants um, from around the world. We have about 1300 participants um, who registered this year from 90 countries. Um, and from every continent except Antarctica. Um, this is uh, amazing to me. Open Repositories has always been a very international conference, but this is really incredible. And um, I think that is a virtue of the virtual format is that we can truly have this type of representation at a conference and this type of participation. Um, uh, it's really lovely to see. So I hope that you'll take opportunities in our networking sessions and asking questions of participants um, to meet people from um, outside of your local context, outside of your country, to, to talk about what's happening in other parts of the world around open repositories, around open access, um, and other areas of, of interest. Um, I think it's really important that we really understand that um, uh, the, the activity that's happening all over the world around these issues. A couple of more logistics, um, as you will have seen, you will be getting daily emails that include the highlights for each day. Um, we'll also include um, uh, links to, you'll also get an email once you're registered in SCED, you'll get emails from SCED that will include um, the things that you signed up for in your agenda. SCED will always include the latest information about the conference, so please do um, always look there for links or other information. As I said, we'll have networking opportunities um, and opportunities to talk to sponsors on a platform called Wonder. I also want to encourage you to check out the posters. All of the posters are um, on the Open Repositories 2021 website. Um, you can um, comment on them there, um, review them. And then tomorrow we'll be having Minute Madness. Um, and so you can hear the um, uh, conversation happening in, in Minute Madness um, about these. But, um, this is one of those, posters are perhaps one of the most challenging things in terms of the logistical pieces of a virtual conference um, because you can't have that poster reception in the same way. So we're hoping by, by putting up the posters, allowing comments that we can allow some conversation there um, and for people to really interact with the posters. So please do take a look at them. I also want to remind everyone of our code of conduct um, that we have for open repositories. Um, please do go and read this. Um, I will say that um, just to repeat a couple of things that we have here on the slide, um, we are dedicated to providing a welcoming and positive experience for everyone, whether we're in a formal session like this or an informal session like a networking session, or on Twitter or um, uh, in um, chat. Um, open repository participants come from all over the world and have a variety of professional and personal and social backgrounds. And we treat all with dignity and respect. We do not tolerate harassment or discrimination in any form. So if you experience or witness a violation of the code of conduct, please direct message the Zoom host or the, the Wonder host um, and email this email address. Um, we will also have folks who are essentially um, monitoring for any kind of conduct um, problems that we can see, um, but please do contact us because we, we may not see everything. Um, and we do reserve the right to take immediate action to um, remedy any disruptive behavior. 
So a little bit about our networking platform, which you'll um, have access to. So at the end of our sessions in OR um, today, there's a hour long networking session where you'll be able to access um, this platform called Wonder. Um, you'll find the link and password in SCED. Um, and this is really an opportunity to have conversations with our sponsors. Um, all the sponsors will have folks there. Um, when you log into Wonder, you'll be asked to enter your name and take a photo just through your webcam. Um, and you can then enter the space and you can use your arrow keys to move around. And so you can have groups of people talking to one another. Um, you can move towards, um, let's say you want to um, uh, talk to one of the sponsors, you can move towards the sponsor and then uh, be able to engage with them. Uh, just as a reminder, of course, the code of conduct applies here as well. There will be hosts in every session and you'll be able to see that through their name. They'll say something like host uh, um, in their name. Um, so you'll be able to see that. This is our first time trying this. So we hope it'll work well. We've, we've tried it out a few times uh, with um, some smaller groups. So I'm hoping that we'll find that this works, um, works well um, for at least giving us a taste of that um, networking experience that um, so many of us have had at past open repositories. So I'm now going to pass the um, uh, the mic over to Arena, who is going to talk a little bit about the program. Um, Arena is one of our program um, co-chairs. I, I actually should pause here and just thank um, Arena, Liz, and Layla, who are our program um, chairs and who have done just a tremendous job pulling together the program, um, wrangling the reviewing process, um, reaching out to, to different keynotes um, to bring folks in. Um, uh, they deserve so much um, thanks um, for the work they've done on this program. Um, so I, I just uh, want to, to acknowledge that um, their, their work on, on this. So over to you, Arena. Thank you so much, Sarah, and welcome everyone. Um, if we go to the next slide, uh, please. Um, I would also like to thank uh, our program committee members sir, and uh, our local hosts, sir, and uh, you will be seeing them at uh, different sessions, sir, networking events as uh, moderators, hosts. Sir. So thanks a lot, sir. Adam Dimiti, Harish, uh, Michele, Andrew, Thomas, Nancy, Washington, uh, Marie, Mimi, Alan, Bennett, uh, Catherine, uh, John, uh, Jessica, David, uh, and of course, Sarah. And I think you all deserve a big round of applause. Sir. Next slide, please. Sir. I would also like to thank our 100 uh, 67 reviewers, sir. Unfortunately, I'm, I won't be able to read all the names, but I would love to. So that, that's another another round of virtual applause. Uh, thank you so much for your help in uh, shaping this program. Uh, and uh, if we could go to the next slide, uh, we'll make slides available and we will list it everyone. And thanks again for reviewing uh, all the submissions. Next slide, please. And um, that's what we were going to present to you today. Yeah. So we have three keynote sessions. So we have 40 conference sessions, uh, 110 contributions, uh, 200 speakers. Sir. And uh, thanks a lot to our workshops hosts. Uh, yesterday, we already had eight workshops. And um, slides and recordings uh, are available on our YouTube channel. Um, and we're also live streaming uh, this event uh, there. And uh, if you give us some more likes, because it's a new ch channel, if we, when we get 100 likes, then we can change a channel name to open repositories, because now it's, it's a bit clumsy, long name. And of course, we upload everything on uh, our open repositories, the other community. So looking forward to the conference. And uh, 
now it's uh, my, my great pleasure. Yes, please, sir. Please change the slides, sir. It's my great. You're muted, Irina. So it's, it's my great pleasure to welcome Jeremy Harar, Farrar. And uh, when uh, we were planning this conference, uh, originally we wanted to have it uh, last year in South Africa under the title Open for All. Uh, how well do repositories support knowledge in the service of society? How well do they enable local knowledge sharing and support not only academic use, but also use in education and practice? Uh, and of course, this year we added uh, a new team, which is uh, New Connections Global Conversations and uh, Pandemic Response. Uh, and uh, I really don't know anyone who can uh, talk about this better. And uh, Jeremy Ferrari is a director of Welcome. And uh, thank you so much, Jeremy, for spending this time with us. Uh, before joining Welcome, uh, Jeremy was uh, director of the Oxford University Clinical Research Unit in Vietnam for 18 years. And uh, uh, his research interests were infectious diseases and global health with a focus on emerging infections. Sir. And uh, has published numerous articles, mentored uh, many dozens of students and fellows, served as a chair on several advisory boards. And uh, he asked me not to read his full bio, but uh, you can read it uh, on the conference website. So thank you so much, Jeremy. And uh, over to you now. Thanks very much, Irina. Th thanks for cutting that short. Um, <laughs> I'll make sure we edit it uh, in a better way in future. And uh, Sarah, thank you very much for the for the introduction as well. It's very um, it's heartwarming and uplifting to have um, uh, an organisation be be so committed to being inclusive and welcoming to everybody wherever everybody is in the world. So thank you very much, uh, Sarah, for that introduction, Arina, for the invitation to to join you. Um, Today, it, it uh, whenever you planned this, and um, and I don't know when your planning started for this, but uh, um, it couldn't, in many ways, come at a better time, uh, and at a time when we all have to to think uh, of the things we do. How are they going to be affected by the events of the last eighteen months or so? Um, uh, and that's why it's such a pleasure to be able to join you uh, today at the Open Repositories uh, conference. Um, because I think COVID in, in many ways uh, has and will continue to, to change everything. Um, and of course, it will not be the last such disruptive uh, event uh, in the 21st century. Uh, if you look at the the drivers of how COVID has come to be such a devastating impact on the world. And just to say at the start, I think we're closer to the start of this pandemic than we are to the end. However, that may feel slightly different in some countries, but at a global level, I think we are closer to the start of the impact of this than to the end. And if you think of the real drivers of COVID and you see COVID as the outcome, but ask what are the real drivers of COVID, uh, and indeed, what have the, been the drivers of the more frequent and more complex epidemics and pandemics of the last 25 years? Those drivers are all drivers which will define in many, many ways the 21st century. And, and that's why I think we have to uh, deal with COVID today and bring it whatever to an end means and do it as fast as we can. Uh, because as I say, we're closer to the start of the pandemic than the end. Uh, but we must also have a little bit of an eye on the future and and start to learn lessons. Um, because if you don't uh, learn lessons from dreadful events such as this, then you are uh, bound to repeat them. And the drivers of COVID are ecological change, environment change, land use change. There are changes in the way animals and humans interact, both domestic animals and wild animals, and how those uh, animals interact uh, with humans, including the agricultural sector. And then humans have changed dramatically in the last 20 years, not necessarily genetically, although of course to some degree they have, but, 
But in terms of society, um, urbanization has been a drive now for decades, if not centuries, and will continue in the coming years. And of course, as in so many aspects of our lives now, trade and travel and supply chains mean the world is very small and indeed getting smaller. And it's those issues which are really the driver of COVID. Um, and actually they are all issues of the 21st century, which are only likely to increase in the speed at which they're happening. And that will inevitably lead, yes, to more complex and more frequent epidemics, regional or global pandemics. But also those drivers are critical for some of the other great challenges of our time. You could argue what they might be, but I might have a list that would certainly include climate, uh, access to energy, access to clean water, the, the uh, threat today or the risk, the reality of drug resistant infections, inequality that's been shown to be such an issue in COVID within and between societies, migration and inevitably we must bring in conflict in that. Uh, humanity has a long track record of seeing conflict as a way out of sometimes its problems and this isn't going to be different in the 21st century. So where that's leading us is that I think there will be a, a convergence happening globally and indeed a, a smallness of the world that the environmental community has known for some time but is starting to impact on the rest of our lives. These issues which I highlight are also critically uh, ones where science will have a really important role. And whenever I use the word science, I mean the very broadest range of science, from social sciences, through biomedical sciences, to engineering, uh, to mathematics, to the physical sciences, to behavioral science, psychology, sociology, and everything else. I see the word science as embracing all of that. And science has undoubtedly a critical role to play, as it is playing in the last 18 months within COVID. But if you take many of those great challenges of our time, it will also come with massive public interest and massive public engagement and an involvement in society and amongst communities. Public and uh, philanthropic funding will need to increase to both prevent and respond to these issues. And it'll have to learn in a way that COVID again has brought home to be able to do those at speed and at scale, that they will have to be transdisciplinary, they will have to be transnational, they'll have to be transparent, and that science, as we wish to define it, will have to have a very direct willingness and ability to share, and to have a direct and willingness to engage, involve, and bring together society, policy, and yes, politics. There will be costs and there'll be trade-offs, there will be debate and there'll be disagreement. And those debates, as we've seen today, in pick out one example, the origins of the virus will often be very polarized and very political. Uh, and that is not an environment, if you like, where I think necessarily the scientific community, which I feel part of, uh, has necessarily felt comfortable with in the past. And why I mention all of that is because I think that has absolutely direct relevance to the, your work you are all doing in terms of openness, transparency, around information and the sharing of that in repositories, in publications, and in the sharing of data. And we must include, when we talk about sharing, the sharing of the benefits that can accrue from that work. Um, so this will change the way we work, it'll change the way we socialize, it'll be, change the way we spend our time working and communicate. So I think we are, if you like, seeing the dawn almost of a of a new era in the way things will work. And COVID has been the awful catalyst to that, but I think it applies to many of the things that we will see and will trouble us and for which there are opportunities if we think ahead of our time. So, so I'm gonna talk for about 15, 20 minutes or so, 25 minutes or so, I hope that is okay and very happy to stay on and take any questions if, if, um, if that's possible. Um, but just to focus now back on the pandemic and my own personal experience, uh, I think it highlights the critical importance of the open access to articles, but also data, and that that was recognized from the start of the pandemic. Uh, at the start of the pandemic, welcome, along with many, many other partners, peers, colleagues around the world, published a statement calling on all researchers, journals, funders, 
to ensure that the research findings and data relevant to the pandemic were shared rapidly and openly to inform the public health responses and help save lives. And to date, over 150, 160 organizations have signed up to that. And I think it's undoubtedly, I hope, played a small role in ensuring more accessible information and more accessible data. And just whilst I'm, before I move off on that, um, and as an aside, we've recently just published a, a call for funding uh, from a combination of funders, including ourselves, to understand the impact of increased requirements for rapid and open sharing of data and how that's actually impacted on our ability to respond. And that's available on the on the Welcome website, among, uh, along with our uh, colleagues and partners who are involved in this as, as well. And publishers have responded to the pandemic and I think do deserve great credit. Uh, they have made the ones that have, have committed to this, made all the COVID related content free to read. And just as an example of that, over 50 publishers have made available, I think uh, over 150,000 COVID related articles over the period of what, the last 15 months or so. Uh, articles free to read in PubMed Central. Uh, and in April 2021 alone, those articles had been viewed more than 17 million times. That is, that is by our estimation, an order of magnitude or more than they would have been uh, had they not been free to, 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 to read by everybody. And crucially, this means this move has highlighted the critical importance of making research articles uh, openly accessible as no one could seriously question in the middle of uh, the worst public health crisis in 100 years to entertain the notion that research findings, which would be critical and have been critical to the advances made in the last 15 months, that that would be somehow hidden behind a paywall available only to some people and not to others, and might be in that sort of nether region of access for six to 12 months or, or potentially even longer. And logically, of course, this gives rise to the notion if we agree that the scientific information related to COVID should not be behind such paywalls, then why not research to other issues that are of equal impact, albeit maybe not at the speed of COVID, but, necessarily, but will by necessity over the coming weeks, months and years have similar impacts or even bigger climate change. I'm thinking about food security and even other health issues such as, as cancer and diabetes. So in some ways, uh, COVID has become through the awful horror of the last 18 months, the poster child for this movement, encouraging all stakeholders, including those that were and may have been antagonistic some time ago, to move to a world where all research findings can be accessed by anyone and everyone, wherever uh, they are. And authors too, have changed their behavior over the course of the last 15 months. For the academic community, which I also am part of, for all of their brilliance in developing new treatments and vaccines for COVID, in, in thinking through the social determinants of the impact of COVID, uh, the way COVID spreads around the world, whichever bit of science that I've mentioned that scientists and the academic community have been working on, nevertheless, I do find, and I say this as a member of this community, uh, that the academic community does remain incredibly conservative with regard to publishing behavior. And although universally, I think, the academic community does bemoan the slow pace of academic publishing, um, the nine months or 12 months that it takes and iterations and time spent away from people doing what they feel they should be doing in terms of their research, uh, that the pandemic has actually started to change that perception. I think there's also a generational issue here and there's a cultural issue across the world. But generally speaking, I think COVID will mark the time when the academic community did shift in their thinking in terms of when and how and why to make their research available. And perhaps the most evident example of this is in the widespread adoption of preprints that authors share their effectively completed manuscripts ahead of submitting them for formal peer review and publication in a more traditional looking journal. And in fact, most of the key COVID papers were first published on any one of a number of archive systems that have been available uh, globally. And that has led to a massive increase, of course, in submissions uh, over the course of the last year or two. 
Um, and of course, there have been questions asked. Not everything that gets uh, available through the preprint service uh, has had the quality assessment that is required. But overall, we all know that there are problems with the more traditional ways of uh, reviewing and not all even peer reviewed articles prove to be as good as perhaps one was uh, thought when they were first released. So I think, again, the peer review system whether, and how it's done in an innovative way can, can, be, can address the issues of the quality of preprints prior to formal submission uh, and uh, an acceptance. And of course, uh, as many of you know better than I do, uh, the peer review system is by no means perfect uh, and uh, uh, articles uh, do inevitably, given the volume and the, the speed at which things happen in, in the formal uh, publication literature, do sometimes uh, need to be retracted or, or changed. And of course, we, we saw the real benefits. I mean, benefits that I think have still been underestimated uh, on the early data sharing in early January, and, and uh, I was uh, very involved in this from when I first heard about COVID on the 30th or 31st of, of December. And by early January, about the 10th or 11th, the uh, first sequence of the SARS-CoV-2 genome was published by a consortium led by uh, Professor Holmes in Sydney and Professor Zhen Zhang from Fudan University in Shanghai. It's difficult to overstate the importance of sharing of that genome sequence publicly. Sharing of that sequence allowed diagnostic tests to be developed around the world and within a week or two of that coming out there were also preprints released and, and published data on the clinical syndrome, on the transmission including asymptomatic transmission of SARS-CoV-2 by about the 24th of January such that actually by the 24th, 25th of January Data had been shared on the genomic makeup of this virus, the way it was transmitted, the fact that there was asymptomatic transmission uh, and the clinical syndrome, which has proved remarkably accurate over the course of the 18 months. So by the end of January, the world knew in effect what was coming. Uh, did the world respond quickly enough to that knowledge? I would argue the, the world, particularly uh, the Western world did not respond fast enough uh, in those uh, last week or so of January, but nevertheless, the information was available. And as a result of that, diagnostic tests, as I've mentioned, but also treatments and vaccines could be started to be developed by about the 20th or so of January. And as a result of that, we have now through science, whether it be behavioral science, vaccines, treatment, diagnostics, actually been able to plot a path that will allow us to exit the worst uh, phase of this pandemic uh, through 21 and 22. And I'll come back to why that is so critical to not just bring open access to the table, but also commit as a world of scientists to sharing the benefits of making that information available. And that is something that we have failed to do to date and we must address if we want there to be true sharing of information. It has to come with a commitment to sharing the benefits of sharing that information. And the debates at the moment around vaccine nationalism and vaccine inequality I think makes this whole argument of sharing of information so much harder uh, because clearly the world is not sharing the benefits of the shared data as well as we could and should do. One critical component that I think funders can play, and I speak now with a hat on of a funder and, and pay tribute to here to the European Commission, but also in the United States, the National Institutes of Health and the US government and, and many others. But funders have started to appreciate that this basic infrastructure which essentially will allow science to take place and for science to bring the greatest benefits to everybody is currently funded on soft-term money uh, and and sort of um, cobbled together over the the previous 10 or 20 years and the european commission the national institutes of the united states and the japanese government amongst many others uh, have uh, developed the uh, data platforms and data infrastructure. In my view, and I'm sure this would be a view shared by many people on this call and this conference, is that these this architecture and infrastructure is sort of equivalent to the 19th century train tracks. Uh, unless we build this infrastructure and do that in a sustainable way uh, that, that, is, that is not going to suddenly fall over when the data demands grow bigger as they inevitably will, I think this is as crucial as the infrastructure that brought us roads and railways 
and uh, sanitation in the 19th century. And we must get that right. And I believe that has to move from soft grant type funding to sustained infrastructure funding, because without it, we will not be able to uh, address the great challenges that I mentioned earlier of the 21st century. But not everything is rosy as it appears. And I'm gonna just perhaps challenge all of us, certainly myself, but, but some perhaps on the call as well, uh, that the sharing of research data is far from universal and some of it does remain hidden in various ways, uh, either behind paywalls, but also data unavailable or only available on request with a lack of clarity about what those requests might, how they may be responded to. A recent search by PubMed Central Europe shows that only 9% of COVID-19 related research articles have any data availability statement, which tells us all uh, how that data can be accessed. That's compared to uh, almost 25% of all research published in 2020. So even COVID, although it is, I think, changed the way we think about these things uh, and could be the catalyst, an awful catalyst, but a catalyst nonetheless that could change the way we work, even that has not yet achieved what I think would be desirable um, uh, in order to improve the outcomes from COVID. And even when authors uh, do include a data availability, availability statement, the criteria for accessing the data is often at best ambiguous or not non-existent. For example, a recent study reported that 8% of da data availability statements mention reasonableness as one of the criteria for granting access. Um, reasonableness is something very difficult to define. It means very different things to different people. Uh, and I think we must gain greater clarity of what really is expected um, of authors, of researchers, of funders um, in order to make the data available. So this behavior is also mirrored in data related to COVID-19 clinical trials, for instance, which have been so critical in saving so many lives. A recent study found that data is only being shared in a minority of cases, about 15%, with nearly half, almost 48% of the trial registries and explicitly saying they're not willing to share the data. These examples highlight there is still a very significant work to be done if we're going to shift the way research is done and the way research is shared. Controversially, I'm, I'm gonna use uh, GISAID, the genomic, uh, viral genomic uh, sharing platform, just as a case study uh, of how this uh, perhaps is working, but perhaps could work even better. Um, this, the issues relate to the data sharing exemplified by the reaction to whether posting of the SARS-CoV-2 sequences in the GISAID repository is sufficiently open. GISAID uh, developed uh, before COVID-19 to protect the rights of researchers who have deposited SARS-CoV-2 sequences, they only make the data available to registered users who agree to make use of them under certain terms and conditions. The supporters of GISAID, and I've been a supporter of GISAID in many ways, but the supporters of GISAID argue that unless researchers are given the protection and the credit that services like GISAID provide, then the likelihood is they will not deposit their sequences anywhere. Other researchers believe that the access and reuse rights that GISAID apply to these genome sequences are too restrictive and support calls from, amongst others, the European Bioinformatics Institute that in the pandemic, these data should be available to anyone and thus should be made available in public repositories like GeneBank and the ENA. This debate, I'm afraid to say, is often characterized by an argument between North and South, between haves and haves nots, between high income and low-income countries, characterized where the rich North wants to get access to the data, to develop new vaccines, to protect their population, whilst those in the Global South may not be able to access uh, the very benefits I talked about earlier. In some ways, this debate is misplaced. As inevitable, as we all know, COVID is, is uh, such a devastating impact on the world, and truly, no one is safe until everyone is safe. But the current inequity in vaccine access that we are seeing playing out is making this argument more complex. I was very involved in a very similar argument uh, in 2004, when the Indonesian Minister of Health at the time asked why should we share the sequences of the H5N1 bird flu, which in 2004 looked as if it may cause a devastating pandemic, 
why should we share these sequences when all you'll do is make vaccines from them and try and sell them back to us at prices we can't afford, leading to a very inequitable uh, access to the vaccines. Tragically, I don't think we've ever honestly answered that uh, challenge from the Indonesian Ministry of Health. And I, and I think some of that is now playing out. And I'm afraid uh, this will get more tense and more complex if the world continues to have an inequitable access to the sharing of the benefits of sharing basic data and sequence information. And we can hide this, we can pretend it doesn't exist, but I think we have to challenge ourselves that if we are going to share data, repositories, information, publications, which I am all in favor of, we have to address the issues of how we ensure we share the benefits of sharing that information. And that's not limited to, but is certainly brought into stark uh, focus around the issues of sharing access to vaccines that we see so inequitably distributed around the world at the moment. One approach to this is what we're doing at Wellcome, which is we've attempted to address these concerns by requiring that COVID sequences arising from our funding must be deposited in both GISAID and in the INSDC repositories at the same time. And Wellcome funded research can request a short delay in terms of access to the data, uh, but that it must then become available in a realistic time frame, which we do define. The last couple of points I'm going to make before finishing is, is public access is not open access. As discussed earlier, it's great that publishers have made the COVID literature free to read. However, that's not truly open access as the right to reuse this data and content is restricted. For example, most articles are still published on an all rights reserved license. Some publishers have made it clear that once the pandemic is declared to be over, or indeed when some deem it to be over, these articles will once again be hidden behind a paywall, demonstrating that there remains a polarized debate here that we would, I think, be well advised to see the polarity of the debate and try and bridge those uh, gaps that do exist um, if we're going to make the experience of the last 15 months um, uh, uh, come, come to have a great benefit even beyond COVID. Funders, I think, have a critical role here. Welcome in partnership with more than 25 funders, including uh, the Gates Foundation, the European Commission, HHMI, UKRI in the UK and the World Health Organization have essentially aligned our OA policies with Plan S now. And I'd like, like to pay tribute here to, to Robert Kiley, who's been so helpful over many, many years in pushing this whole agenda and uh, uh, to thank him very much for all his thoughts and leadership on this issue. Under this policy that we now have in place, all research articles which arise from our funding must be made open accessible at the time of publication with no embargo and be licensed in ways which allows the others to reuse the content in ways of their choice, subject only to the norms of academic behaviour such as attribution and credit. So in conclusion, um, I think COVID has changed our lives um, and pay tribute to all healthcare workers, researchers uh, around the world who have worked so hard to try and find an exit strategy. Uh, but I believe that the, co the COVID is, if you like, a, a symptom of an era that we are now moving into, uh, which will not be COVID-like, but which will have some of the same drivers and where science is going to have to find a different way of working, of engaging, of sharing, and sharing the benefits of. And I think the COVID has perhaps uh, shone a spotlight in a way that this community knows very well, but perhaps the broader community doesn't, that there are shortcomings in the way that the scholarship publishing uh, community works, and that that does not always work in the best interests of the public that it serves, given so much of, of funding for science globally is funded through taxpayer and philanthropic funding. Uh, I think we all accept that the current publishing system is not serving the public as well as it could and should do. And COVID is an example, and that's why I think COVID is in, in like, if you like, an awful catalyst, um, and we must not underestimate uh, the continued impact of COVID. But I think it is symptomatic of the sorts of challenges we're going to face in the 21st century, all of which are global, are transnational, are complex systems, uh, bring about inequalities, uh, where science has a critical role to play, 
but science as a part in a different way of society and amongst policymakers and amongst politicians where decisions really matter, information really matters. And often those decisions have to be made earlier than you might like amid uncertainty and are often part of a polarized political and societal debate where conspiracy ideas thrive, social media has both its positives and negatives, and there are inevitably vested interests. So science is also moving into a new era. And the way we do science, the way we conduct science, the way we engage, the way we involve societies that we are all part of, I think will define how much science truly contributes to finding solutions to these great challenges of the 21st century, of which COVID is a very acute and horrific example, but will not be the last of its type or the other great challenges we face. So I think as a community of scientists and people committed to making sure the science is shared in an equitable way with the global public and with all colleagues in science and politicians, I think we have to challenge ourselves to think how can we bridge the current polarized debate about publications, about data sharing, about repositories, and how can we absolutely commit as scientists that our work not just is shared, but that it becomes uh, equitably available to everybody that needs it. And I think we need to seize the opportunity, challenge ourselves and ensure that all research is published in a fast, open and transparent way in which supports reproducibility, addresses the very issues of benefit and engenders trust, addresses the issues of inequality, but also can bring about the very positive and lasting outcomes, both for this awful health emergency, but also, as I say, for the great challenges of the 21st century. So Irina and Sarah, thank you very much for the invitation to come. I'll finish there and hand back to you. Um, I hope that was of, of some interest. Thank you so much, Jeremy. That was very powerful. And uh, I love your railroad tracks metaphor. I'll be using it when I'll be talking about infrastructures because it's, it's really right there. And I was wondering, uh, we represent a community of public institutions, public infrastructures, sir. it's a global community. And um, what do you think could we do as, sir, as a community to enable positive things happen? Uh, speaking about infrastructures, is it about community governance and community principles and defining what really matters for specific research communities and uh, making uh, those principles and governance as part of uh, data sharing or publication sharing practices? Uh, could this be done on, on the global scale? Any, any recipe for us uh, from your experience? Yeah, I think it is all of those. Governance is critical and people have to have trust in governance. Um, I think, you know, some of the challenges to GISAID as, a, as just as an example, but it's not limited to GISAID, is do people have trust in the system? Uh, will it work for them? Um, is it accessible as, as this community has so strongly argued for? But I think the other thing that COVID changes and it's related to this is I think stopping at the science, stopping at the governance issues, stopping at the organization is not enough. Um, we can see how these issues, and it's true for climate, drug resistance, energy access, water access, uh, gender equality, you know, these are social and political issues as well. And I think, I think we as scientists need to embrace that and not not if you like, be frightened about it. If you want to bring about change, we, we must and, and will do work within the scientific world. But I think we also have to work within the rest of society where science flourishes. That means, yes, of course, with the public, with communities, that yes means uh, in politics and in policy making. And that's not being natural bedfellows sometimes for scientists. Uh, and after COVID with the horrific um, social media responses to some scientists, death threats and other things. It's not a particularly attractive place to be, but, but I think if we want to really change things, then we have to embrace a voice into that debate uh, and to do so from the basis of knowledge, but also some principles that you rightly say about sharing, sharing of benefits, sharing of data, sharing of, of public resources um, and be involved and not be frightened about that debate. Uh, science has never, well, in recent memory, really, 
had a platform where it's been so much in the public eye as with COVID over the last 15 months and uh, it won't just go away again. And I think that's the new world we have to embrace. Thanks a lot. That's very encouraging. We have a question in the chat from Ellen. Uh, Jeremy, can you say something on the benefits of open access for achieving UN sustainable development goals? Thanks. Yeah, I, I, it goes back to, I think, um, uh, the, the comments about um, the equivalent of the 19th century train and uh, roads uh, sanitation systems. We, we can't achieve the sustainable development goals, which we will come, we have not lost. Uh, they remain, I believe, the, the best pathway to a sustainable future and a healthier and less inequitable future. Um, but without the, the ability of the broad scientific endeavor to contribute to them uh, and the, the willingness to share that with the world and to ensure that that science becomes part of policy making. Uh, and, um, and we do that transnationally. Then I don't think we can, we will achieve, we cannot achieve the SDGs, certainly not within the time frame that they have been laid out for. So I think, again, COVID has demonstrated that you can make progress at a speed that frankly, most scientists thought was impossible a year ago. Uh, and the open access way that that has happened has, has been a major part of both the speed with which it's been achieved, but also at the quality of which it's been achieved. Um, uh, but, and there is a big but at the end of this, if we do not also commit to sharing the benefits, then that scientific endeavor will only add to the inequalities that exist. And, and that's why I think we have to challenge ourselves as how to bring these twins together. Sharing is critical, uh, but so is the sharing of the benefits. Thank you so much. Kathleen is asking, uh... Thanks for the great talk. The inequality often comes about uh, because of commercialization, as highlighted by your Indonesian example. Do you think there should be limitations or constraints to commercial participation in open science, open access system? Yeah, uh, no, I don't. I, don't. I, I think we've got, we, we, we cannot see, I'm against seeing the world fragmented in, by either nation states, by disciplines of science, or indeed by academia versus industry, uh, uh, because we will, we, we cannot achieve the SDGs, we cannot bring the pandemic to an end, unless we find an accommodation between public and private sector, uh, the strengths of both of them, um, uh, the role they both play, the critical need for the public sector to invest in both infrastructure and academic work and, and science, but also an appreciation that with a very few exceptions, the public sector is not going to make those vaccines uh, at the scale that, that is required or the drugs that will save people's lives or other events, uh, engineering, whatever it is in other sectors beyond the biomedical sector. And so I, I think, again, for me, the lesson of COVID is how interrelated this all is, whether it is national relatedness, whether it is the sharing of genomic sequences, or the willingness to work across disciplines within the academic sector, or the willingness of the academic sector and the industrial sector to work together. I just think we need transparency about what each brings to the table and transparency about what is the driver of, of those sectors. But I do not believe the future lies in exclusion. I think it lies, as Sarah said at the beginning of this talk, about being inclusive, about bringing the diverse skills that are required and that will sometimes be in the public sector and it'll sometimes be in the private sector. We need to embrace those because neither can do it on their own. Thank you so much. There is a question from Moni. Thank you for your excellent talk, Jeremy. The Wellcome Trust has done great work with researchers in low and middle income countries uh, and open data sharing. How can other funders model your work indeed provide low and middle income countries the tools to lead the data activities uh, for example through funding for infrastructure staff other resources rather than through the sponsored organizations in high impact countries sir uh, thinking investment and strat strat strategy locally is a key 
Yeah, sorry, Irina, I can't see the questions before they pop up. I'm not sure if I've... Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, so it's uh, it, it, oh, no, in the Q&A. I've got them. It, it, sorry. It, it's a, it's the first one uh, in the Q&A. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I think on this, again, I mean, again, we, we, can, we can use COVID as an excuse, uh, or we can say it was a trend that was happening. And I, I believe it was a trend that was happening before COVID. And, and I think this gets to, at least starts to address the issues around data sharing. I think it addresses the issues of inequality of access to the benefits. And that is a phrase I've used too many times. And, and that is a, a shift in the center of gravity. It is, it is great to hear that there are uh, 1300 participants in this conference from 90 countries. Uh, it's disappointing there's nobody from Antarctica, but it's great to see all other continents represented. And I think, and this, and I think you're leading on on some of these areas, and the 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 the, the fallout from COVID, the virtual conferences, the ability to to link up in ways that we probably thought were unimaginable two years ago, gives us a great opportunity to what I call shift the center of gravity. And and what I mean by that is is where the research agendas, the decision making processes, uh, the transparency is not based in Washington or, or in Paris or London or, 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 or Beijing, but is, but is based um, where the issues are at their greatest. And I think that comes back again to some of the, the issues that you've raised around governance, transparency, um, uh, and the, the more we can shift this, including uh, because funding and money is a route to achieving this. You can't do it without those. Uh, and also around good governance, uh, I think will allow a more democratic and more equitably globally shared research agenda. And I think then some of the issues around sharing of data and sharing the benefits of sharing that uh, can be of at least mitigated, if not completely removed. Thank you. And there is a question from Hardy. Thanks for this great talk. I'm wondering if you see a role for sharing data sets with licenses that mandate mm. sharing sharing of derivative works, for example, Creative Commons uh, attribution share alike. Yeah, Hardy, it's a great question. I mean, I I think that that it, I think that is the sort of thinking we need is 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 if you like to think where are we today, and where would we like to be, you know, not just sort of incrementally, but can we use the horror of the last 18 months to say, really, as a result of open sharing from that genome sequence on the 10th or 11th of January to the information on the 24th of January, that we had the information we needed within a month, really, of the first cluster being identified. And as a result of that, we have the social behavior, the sociology, the anthropology, the behavioral sciences, the vaccines, the treatments within a time frame. That is, those are related. So not, don't ask the question of where are we today and can we consolidate that, but where would we like to be to address these great challenges in due course? And can we use the, the speed at which things have happened that have challenged everybody to think in a different way to be, what would we really like to play, have in place? To, to ask the question, what if we could do this rather than what can we get away with? And so questions like that from, from Hardy uh, asking, you know, can you see a role here for mandating sharing of derivative works and making sure that credit flows as a result of that, along with other? That's, I think, the sort of question we can now and should be asking. Thank you so much. And speaking about speed, uh, I, I was wondering, how do you cope with pressure? Because we, we've been complaining that we have all this Zoom fatigue and um, multitasking and working from home and everything. But I, I can imagine that in your line of work, this pressure has always been very, very high. And uh, what's, what's your recipe? I don't think there is any recipe. And I'm, I'm sure my pressure on me is no greater than anybody else. At the moment, I don't have to write grants, which I always found one of the most difficult and pressured situations possible. I think for me and everybody is different. I, I, I think we, the most important thing for me is that you have somewhere to go, a place or a time, I think it doesn't matter. Uh, I think time is more important than place, uh, where, you, where you can, if you like, escape to, to 
to reduce the pressures that you put on yourself and others may or may not put on you. And uh, I've just come back, for instance, from a long weekend on the west coast of Scotland, which um, uncharacteristically was wall to wall sunshine and and uh, a stunningly uh, a natural spot on the west coast of Scotland. And just getting away there for what was in the end about two days uh, made a huge difference. I, I, I do escape a lot by, by playing sport. Uh, um, I know others do the same by playing music or reading poetry or whatever. I just think we have to have somewhere we can go where you're a little bit protected. You, you can go into a different world almost. Uh, and um, and it's a sort of not a secret space, but it's a it's a, a space you can go to and um, and just shake off some of those pressures that that are no different to me to everybody else. Thank you so much. When we were planning your talk, our colleague Claire shared uh, a recording of uh, your talk with Lauren Lavelle uh, on desert island discs, uh, and I put in a link in the chat, and that 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 was an excellent program and I, I really enjoyed listening to it and it was very inspiring to me so if you have time listen to it as well and uh, thank you so much Jeremy that was excellent sir thanks a lot for spending this hour with us sir and for for your leadership uh, and all for, for all your work uh, no, thank you very very much indeed um, it's a pleasure to join you the, the work that you are all doing is phenomenal and is making a difference. All I would say to you in challenge is don't stop. Um, ask the question, what if, rather than let's make it a little bit better. Um, and I think dream of what things could be, uh, because you never know. If you don't dream, you won't achieve them. Um, so thank you for all you do. Thank you so much. What, what inspiring words to end on. So. <laughs> Thank you. I'll Thanks. have to drop off, but mm -hmm. thank you so have, much. Have a nice you know, afternoon. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. So we are moving on with um, our program and um, We can either start straight away with uh, with ideas challenge, or we can take five minutes break. Or so, what, what do you say, uh, Nick? Uh, that's uh, hi, Irina. Hi, everyone. Uh, that's that's really up to uh, up, up to you. And and uh, I mean, it was such an inspiring uh, talk. Uh, it might be that people will need some time to to get everything in and to think about it a little bit more. And uh, uh, this session will last for 45 minutes. So either uh, we start like in five and we, we end a little bit before the next one. Um, so to give small breaks uh, in between sessions. Because I think it's also a good bridge to the ADS challenge because that, that's where we can yeah. really think big and, and dream. Uh... It is. That's what I was thinking, actually, and and, and it's interesting because, uh, especially at the end, I mean, the, the the talk itself was very inspiring, and then he thought about dreams, and uh, that's what uh, open repositories have been trying to push for the past few years with the ideas challenge is dreaming about solutions that can actually solve problems and. Uh, and so I'm I'm happy to 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 start now and uh, and give time to to Thomas also to to present uh, something. If why don't we go ahead and get started then? Cool. Yeah. Perfect. Um, so I I have a few slides uh, that I can that I can share. Uh, if you don't mind, let me know if you actually see uh, the slides. In the right order, or I have to flip. We have we see them in a presenter mode. Okay. You have to un untick uh, yeah. the view. Yeah. And uh, let me introduce uh, Michele Minelli from Lyrasis, who was driving uh, Open Repositories Ideas Challenge uh, for for the past year. And at the session we are in now, welcome if you've just joined us. It's, it's still in uh, in the presenter mode. 
I think in the PowerPoint you have to untick uh, presenter mode. How about now? Yeah, now now it's it's perfect. Okay, Over yeah. to you. Uh, thank you, thank you, Irina, and uh, and uh, hi everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, that's the that's the beauty of of a virtual meeting in general, but particularly of uh, open repository. And it's astonishing the numbers of registrations and the high interest for this conference uh, over the year. Um, I'm not gonna uh, uh, take too much time for for this because I'm I'm here just to present something new that we're trying to do last year and, uh, and uh, the brothers uh, here. Uh, it, it was a challenge itself uh, to, to think about how Ideas Challenge could actually work remotely uh, because Ideas Challenge is an initiative of, of open repositories that is based on social networking uh, and in-person chat, informal chats that happens throughout the conference. Now, doing this and moving this uh, 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 virtually and, and, and spread it over uh, a full year. Uh, it was a challenge, but uh, it was rewarding uh, for several aspects. We learned a lot and, uh, and we're trying to present the results here. Um, so everything started last June, so basically a year ago. Um, with the first social gathering that we had to brainstorm about uh, different ideas. We, we, we picked the themes of the conference and I put them all together in four main themes and in inclusivity, integration, access and discovery and policies and copyrights. And uh, so we gathered together with anyone who wanted to, to think about new things and dream about new ideas. Uh, we split our rooms in four and we just have conversations for one hour. Um, it, it, it wasn't a packed room, obviously, as it is uh, the one today, but there were over 25 people from all over the world discussing about different ideas. I'm going to share the links of um, uh, the, 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 the results of their conversations later in the chat. But we used um, a kind of a mind mapping tool uh, to brainstorm uh, around uh, a few ideas. And the result you see here, uh, obviously you can't really read it, uh, but, but everything is public and then and I'll share it later on. Um, so after the first meeting, we, we had a second meeting, uh, which was a little bit more operational, let's say. After gathering a bunch of ideas, we met, uh, we met again and uh, we uh, uh, gave the opportunity to, to the presenters, let's say, or the group coordinators to share uh, a little bit more details on the ideas they had in mind, to try, we call it pitch recruit and brainstorm, uh, to try to, to get the attention and interest of other members of the communities. And uh, that conversation ended up with four main ideas and groups uh, that uh, had the chance to meet throughout the year and present something today. Now, as I said at the beginning, so the, the um, I, I'll say it later on. So, as I said at the beginning, the challenge was to try to keep uh, the attention going and and the and the, and the groups working in in such a long time. Uh, but Thomas today will 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 be a little bit more uh, uh, explicit about that and his experience because he was coordinating the first group. Uh, Wikidata, uh, 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 DBpedia, and, and, and uh, algorithm. And he's going to go a little bit more in detail with that presentation. But what we did uh, after that meeting, we created a, a, a Slack channel for the Ideas Challenge and uh, where people could actually interact and share ideas. And, um, and I'll share the link with the descriptions and the, and the, and the groups of, of the uh, different four ideas uh, later on in the chat. Um, so the, uh, the other idea is one is the PubPub integrations with repositories. Another one is, as you can see here, is the open post publication publishing systems and integrations with other data sources. And then another idea was split in two, which is the repository information page. And then the idea was to scrub incitations from a task full text and display that against the repository record. Out of those four ideas, one will be presented today. Uh, but that doesn't mean that the other ideas were completely abandoned. So that's the, the, the next step that we wanted to suggest today. Um, after, the, after Thomas' presentations and, and the, 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 the interesting way uh, his group actually interacted in, in the past year, the idea will, will, will be to use this conference to give you the chance to 
join the conversations around those ideas. So the, the Slack channel is still active. Um, uh, you can still ask questions and if you're interested, participating and see uh, if there's a way during the conference to, um, uh, to, to move those ideas a little bit forward. Uh, at the end of the conference, as you probably see in the program, uh, there's, uh, there's a slot uh, after, after the, the closing remarks. This is not for ideas challenge again. Uh, the idea would be for anyone who is interested in sharing new ideas because you, maybe you got inspired during the conference and you have something you want to share and suggest and, and you, you, you have something in mind you want to work in next year. Uh, the other option would be for you to, to join those conversations and as a group present something uh, during that slot. If you have a new idea that you want to share uh, uh, at the end of the conference and you want to get someone uh, involved and work on this during the year, you're going to have exactly as, like Thomas today, uh, a slot and a, the opportunity uh, during next year conference, most likely in person this time, to present uh, what you've been working on. So uh, to try to create a link between uh, uh, conferences and, and uh, uh, get inspired in one and present uh, to the next one. Uh, those are everything I had to say. I'm going to uh, let Thomas uh, uh, share the idea and his experience uh, with, this, uh, with this new uh, concept of the ideas challenge. And, uh, and I will share all the links uh, with useful information in the chat later on. So thank you so much. And Thomas, the uh, floor is yours. Thank you, Michele. Um, uh, good morning, everyone. I guess morning for me anyway. Uh, so I'm I'm going to share my screen. Uh, so can everyone see that? Um, yes. Okay, great. Thank you. So, um, so I yeah I'm going to uh, I'm very happy to be uh, presenting this uh, the work of our uh, Ideas Challenge team that took place over the last year, starting in the, at the last year and. Uh, around this time, um, myself and Irina actually will uh, present on behalf of this team. Um, that includes uh, uh, Daisy, uh, Tembe, Nicholas, uh, Thomas, uh, Joe, Heather, Stain, uh, Heather, uh, Francisco, uh, Phil, Kathleen, uh, Victor, and, and, and Slava. Uh, so, um, yeah, I, I'll talk a bit about the process um, uh, of, 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 you know, the, the series of meetings that we had. Uh, I'll go over the original pitch that uh, all of this, this idea challenge started with and what the actual challenge uh, that, we, that we tackled and, um, and to share some results of what we learned along the way because it really was a, an experience of learning um, over the course of the year. Um, so in terms of the process, we, you know, we had our, I, I had my, uh, the original pitch to, for the idea, which was all about integrating essentially wiki data and repositories. Um, and uh, we had a good uh, a good uh, discussion there, and you know, with COVID, uh, things uh, 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 didn't progress quite quite so much actually in, uh, until the end of the year, towards the end of the year, when we started to meet again on a more regular basis. We had a series of meetings, and what was really uh, uh, nice about this normally ideas challenge is a very short uh, time span, and um, but because we had more time, we uh, it was uh, we could take on uh, I guess more ambitious challenges, and so uh, and 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 bring in more people. And so over the course of the year, we had new members join the team uh, and uh, participate in meetings, and and um, and they would find about it through uh, through word of what uh, word of mouth or um, uh, through through other meetings or through connections. And so so. Um, uh, so just to jump to the, the 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 original pitch, this is kind of from my from my original pitch. Uh, you, you probably all know this, but I'll just say that uh, we all know. I mean, Wikipedia is a crowdsourced encyclopedia in multiple languages. So uh, the relationship between that and DBpedia is that DBpedia is an auto extracted machine readable structure from from uh, Wikipedia, and there are separate data sets for each language. Uh, and Wikidata is really a unified data set for all languages. So its scope is broader than, than Wikipedia and Wikipedia. 
it's, it's, it's crowdsourced link data for, for all knowledge. Um, so content is extracted from uh, Wikipedia to Wikidata and vice versa, because uh, actually Wikidata shows up uh, in info boxes in Wikidata. And so really the question is how are, where do repository items fit in with this, uh, uh, with this structure? Are, are they represented? Um, and uh, that's where we began. Um, and so as an example of a Wikidata entry, you see is that you, it's, it's unified uh, for languages, meaning that there's one uh, identifier uh, and, and, and label, but there are also translated labels in many languages. Um, and so, you know, the potential benefits of integration with Wikidata that were identified early on was you know, increased visibility, uh, multilingual indexing of repository contents, uh, also suggestions for uh, places in Wikipedia that are relevant to what the people are depositing. Uh, also the, the ability to, there are some very nice built-in visualization tools in Wikidata. Um, also the uh, increase of institutional knowledge about what, uh, research outputs of the institution. And uh, this was added, this one was added uh, later, uh, credit to Slava, which, which is the idea of the semantic search becoming reality. So, you know, the, the knowledge graph, the search by concept idea. Um, we, uh, just, uh, just to go back to the slide, we decided to focus on, after the second meeting, really to try and uh, focus on the multilingual indexing aspect. Um, and, and why did we find that to be a you know, kind of a compelling use case? And not that the other ones are, are less com compelling, but we found this particularly compelling in part because in the context of an international conference on open repositories seemed like a, a really appropriate place to be addressing linguistic diversity as well of, of, of research uh, access. Um, also, um, uh, language allows you to have ideas otherwise unhavable. And by extension, people who own different words live in different conceptual worlds. So, um, you know, the beauty of this is a, this is a, the idea from Benjamin Lee Worf, and, and so the you know the beauty of linguistic diversity is that uh, reveals to us how ingenious and how flexible the human mind is. This is a quote by uh, Lyra Boroditsky, who has studied uh, the impact of uh, language on thought. Um, so human minds have invented not one cognitive unit, but seven seven thousand and. The example that's given in this article, which I thought is really interesting, is that of a, a five-year-old girl in, in a small Aboriginal community in Northern Australia, who is able to point, uh, like any other speaker of that language, to immediately point to North if asked. And if I asked you all to point North or South right now, if you would be able to get it right away, I'm not sure, but the speakers of this Kuktayora language uh, can always, uh, always know their cardinal directions because uh, they, the, the language uses those uh, uh, to this, at, all, at all scales. And so um, you, you would say, for example, the cup is southeast to the plate and the boy is standing south of Mary. Uh, uh, the boy that is standing south of Mary is, is, is my brother, this sort of thing. Um, so, um, and specific, more specifically in, in the science communication and, and research literature, uh, you know, it's a, there are compelling motivations, you know, to increase linguistic diversity, publishing uh, and access. So there's evidence, for example, that studies publishes, published in languages other than English are often neglected um, when research teams conduct systematic reviews. There is a dominance of English in scholarly communication is, which is evident in natural science, but it's also evident in the social sciences. And so this quote uh, from uh, Irina Balkova, the director general of UNESCO, uh, comments like this about this, uh, social science endeavor is also poorer for its bias towards English and English speaking developed countries. This is a missed opportunity to explore perspective and paradigms that are embedded in other cultural and linguistic traditions. Um, and so uh, a more culturally and linguistically diverse approach by the social sciences would be of tremendous value to organizations such as UNESCO. Uh, in terms of fostering mutual understanding and intercultural dialogue. And, uh, you know, in an article based on the 1996-2012 content in JSTOR and Scopus, for example, uh, which was found to be nearly 90% English, uh, authors commented further that this shortcoming of the social sciences in terms of incorporating non-English research seems ironic because um, the social sciences study societies and social phenomena 
and social science research informs social, economic, and cultural policies, and language is integral to all of that. Um, and so, you know, translations of metadata, such as keywords, titles, abstracts, are, are a recommended way, as one of the recommended ways of increasing multilingualism in, in science communication. So some of our team members uh, were from the Africa Archive, which was launched in August 2018 to foster language diversity and science communication in traditional African languages. It is contributing to decolonization by promoting an understanding of decolonization through preprints, accepting preprint submissions in both uh, lingua franca and native languages, and enabling ownership of African research by Africans through establishing a decentralized Africa-owned digital repository for um, the African continent. Um, and so uh, to demonstrate here, I, see, I, I show you here uh, a wiki data entry for Lyme disease, and you could see that one of the translated labels in Polish for this is uh, borreliosa. And when you do a search uh, uh, for, for this in different search engines, you see that there is, uh, if you search for Lyme disease versus borreliosis, it just demonstrates also this idea of semantic search clearly is not yet working because the, the number of results is, is, is uh, there's no comparison. So, uh, in, in terms of this test, the base that has a multilingual search option and it retrieved uh, about 7,500 articles in, when searching for the Polish uh, term versus uh, 15,000 15, in English. So that's at least uh, uh, around 50% um, when, when the multilingual option is, is, is on. But all of the other search engines that we tried, so Google Scholar, which retrieved you know, 140,000 versus uh, 1,600, um, open air search, PubMed Central, a core, uh, uh, it's, it's, it, there's, there's really no comparison in, in terms of searching for these you know, two languages. And there's no real um, gateway between, uh, between the two languages. These search engines aren't really informing when I search in English of the content, the, 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 some, the, some of the content that exists in, uh, in Polish and, and, and vice versa. Um, and to be clear, uh, you know, an engine, search engine like Google Scholar, which, which is very popular, does have um, uh, an option to search for pages written in any language. But uh, so, so why, why does it include, uh, why does it exclude uh, so much content in English on Lyme disease when I enter the name of disease in Polish, um, uh, et cetera. So, so uh, the reason is, uh, uh, in general, search engines like Google Scholar exhibit a preference for translations of full text only and have kind of a difficulty in, uh, uh, as a matter of policy and or technology for indexing translated metadata specifically, and especially multilingual content that isn't clearly partitioned into pages that include only one language at a time. Uh, these search engines only want to know what your preferred language is and only serve you results in the language that they think is your preferred language. So, uh, you know, multilingual uh, journal abstracts, keywords, and titles have existed for a really long time, even before journals moved um, online. So this is an example of a chemistry journal that includes content in German, French, and English with translations of abstracts and titles um, uh, provided. Um, so this, this example is actually a French language article, but searching for keywords that appear in English yields only a sort of a citation record. Uh, in Google Scholar and without a link. And, and, and there's a comment that says, uh, showing the best results for the search, clicking on, uh, and you, you could you click on see all results. And so if you jump through that hoop, you actually get a link to the French language title. So, so, um, and, uh, so and, and this, this issue isn't um, uh, just an issue for uh, uh, search engines. It's also an issue for publishers and data providers in that if you could examine the metadata for this item, um, you see that uh, because this, this is a, actually the full text is in French, but uh, it is uh, sort of incorrectly tagged as being in English um, and which includes the crossref metadata for it. Um, and so I think there is a general, uh, we could really, uh, uh, we could really do, uh, there's a lot of work to be done to sort of improve how we uh, the metadata that we provide for uh, a multilingual sort of translated titles, translated keywords, and uh, translations of full text. Um, this is an example of uh, a search in, 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 um, 
searching for an article title in, in Portuguese brings up actually an English search result in Google Scholar because the full text is in English. This is actually an example of some uh, where, it, where it works well um, in, in, from, a, from a, uh, an article that is uh, in Cielo. So this article is, uh, I think the full text is in English, but uh, because there's translations of, of the title in Portuguese, you could actually uh, find it easier, um, uh, more easily. Um, and so uh, we experimented, you know, I, the Ideas Challenge has always been about sort of uh, trying things. And so we experimented with, uh, we wanted to experiment with actually tagging um, repository contents um, uh, with uh, using some sort of a, a machine learning algorithm or some sort of an automated way to enrich repository contents uh, with Wikidata. Uh, just be before I move on here, we also had uh, I want to make sure to, to state that we had this discussion about what translation really, the broader theme of translation, what it means for repositories. And you know, I sort of ident I identify, let's say three, uh, say levels of translation. So there's the translation of the, the interface itself, the, the functional links, the informational labels. There's the translations of metadata field values and the translation of the full text content. And, and what we're focused on is that middle one, which is the the translations of the actual translations of metadata field values. Um, and so in order to be able to do that though, right, we have to, we uh, need a way to, to present that metadata. We need a way to, sh to share that metadata with search engines, with, uh, with aggregators. And, and, and we realized uh, quickly in our discussions, in our meetings that we're, we were actually confused about how to do that. What, is, what are the best practices for doing that? And so, Part of the results here is, is really the, the sharing of, of what, what we learned. And so, uh, and of course, how you share that depends on what the context is. In the context of uh, HTML and, and uh, Dublin Core and high wire press tags, which is very common context for repositories of, of sharing the metadata just as, as HTML pages, um, we have uh, this lang and uh, attribute in HTML and uh, similarly, an XML lang attribute for XML based uh, content such as XHTML. And so this really specifies the primary language of the elements content and for any elements attributes that contain text. So um, this means that you can uh, assign this attribute to, to, to really any element uh, in HTML5. And the way in which you construct um, these language uh, tags, these language codes, this is as far as I can see the best practice, the current best practice for doing that. There is uh, an ISO, a couple of ISO standards. There's a LUT two letter uh, ISO standard uh, uh, 6391, um, which is the recommended one really, uh, because it's uh, the simplest, unless you, you need to make it more complex. Uh, and so this BCP, this RFC 5646, sort of describes how to augment that if you need to be more specific. So for example, if you want to say that it's English, uh, but as used in the United States, you put a dash, you separate it by dash and add the US uh, at the name of the country or the region where, where, of the language, or you could also add the writing system. So in this case, the Serbian written using the Cyrillic script would be SR-CYRL. Um, and here you see uh, on the slide, you have how you could uh, use uh, Dublin Core uh, to uh, the DC subject, you would add a language equals Japanese or Polish or English. And similarly for high wire press tags, which are the sort of the preferred uh, press ta uh, tagging that Google Scholar lists, uh, you would do, you'd use citation keywords and then you would uh, separate the keyword groups by language and specify which language they're in. Uh, so this search for uh, um, kind of multilingual structures, multi, like multilingual tagging, uh, for me, it began with this journal, the JATS, Journal Article Tag Suite. It's a NISO standard. It's an old standard, uh, old, dating back to early 2000s. Um, it's used by big publishers, the National Library of Medicine. Um, uh, Plan S has recently uh, commented on having this as a recommendation. Um, uh, in terms of the way in which that uh, they have some clear recommendations on how to deal with translated abstracts, translated titles, and they actually have their own uh, separate 
a trans title tag and a separate trans abstract tag, for example. But they, because it's an XML format, they use the, the standard XML lang attribute, which can be applied um, to kind of uh, almost any element, including this identifying these translations of abstracts and titles. And for specifically for us, for Wikidata, um, they actually uh, include uh, the, some nice recommendations for uh, uh, for keywords. And again, so if it's just a uh, the, the, the keywords are actually grouped by language here. And so you have this keyword group tag where you specify the language of it using the XML lang attribute and you list uh, all the keywords in that language. And what's really nice is you can also include, you can make it more sophisticated and actually include uh, the name of the controlled vocabulary, the identifier and the term identifier as well um, uh, for, uh, for each of the keywords. Um, so uh, in terms of other standards, uh, metadata standards uh, that used uh, is, is we have, for example, data site schema does a good job. It has some com comprehensive uh, recommendations for including subject tags. Uh, and as well, this, this, this scheme URI, value URI and, and language. So the scheme URI is uh, in this case would be you know, the link to Wikidata. The value URI would be the specific link to the the, the so-called Q code, the concept, uh, uh, the specific concept, uh, you augment that with the language and of the label and uh, list each language. Now, um, uh, OpenAir uses kind of the data site schema, recommends the data site schema for data repositories, but in their latest version of the guidelines for literature repositories, however, uh, there, is, uh, there isn't really anything uh, like this. So, um, all that is there is a language at the content level. So no explanation for how to include granularity for providing translated keywords or titles or abstracts. Um, so there's only kind of a, it's, it's really the language of the full text that you can specify only. So I think that's something that could change. By the way, this, uh, the, second, uh, uh, the second concept here on this, on this slide is the concept, uh, uh, it's, I hope I pronounced this right in Japanese, komorebi. It's a, let's say translated roughly as light that filters through the trees. You can see the, the, the Wikipedia page for this beautiful concept. And so it's an example to why I like this example is because, uh, you know, there's not a lot of translations of this, of this, of this label that exists as an entity in Wikidata. And the, uh, but the label is translated maybe to one or two languages and sort of not in English or in, um, uh, not in English. And so when tagging, uh, we, that doesn't mean, I guess what I'm saying is it doesn't mean that uh, because we use Wikidata that the, uh, all of the language, languages will have all of this, uh, will have equivalency in terms of labels. And there's actually a lot of interesting work that needs to be done in adding uh, more labels in more languages to Wikidata. Um, so uh, schema.org is another one that, uh, that, that I looked at. Uh, so uh, they introduced recently a uh, defined term, which is, again, you can specify like in the other uh, formats, you can specify, this is a JSON format. Uh, you can specify the, uh, you know, the scheme URI, the, the, the identifier itself and the, and the name. However, when you try to signal what language the label is in that then the, uh, let's say the, the schema.org validator from Google complains that uh, the language is not an expected property of defined term. And, and I think it should be. Now, schema.org is, is an open community process developed uh, initiative. So I think we have maybe a role there to play to advocate for language becoming a, a property. Um, uh, yeah. So uh, anyway, it's it's just it's 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 what it, the validator gives a warning at this point, and so it's not like it's a it's an error to provide the name of the language. Um, Irina, are you going to say a few words about Dublin Core? Yes, um, we also looked at uh, existing guidelines for repository managers on uh, exposing uh, metadata in uh, different languages. Uh, and uh, you can see on the slide uh, some examples uh, 
how the title uh, could be displayed uh, in a repository in different languages, or there is also a recommendation uh, how keywords uh, could be uh, included in uh, DC subject field. Uh, then maybe if we go to the next slide, uh, we also consulted with uh, our colleagues from uh, JP Core in Japan, and uh, they uh, developed uh, JP Core metadata schema. And uh, you can see an example here from uh, University of Tokyo repository, and uh, there is a title uh, in uh, Japanese and uh, language is specified as Japanese. And uh, uh, there is also alternative title uh, in English. Uh, the same goes for creator. So there is creator in, uh, in Japanese uh, and then alternative creator in English. Uh, and uh, there is a language tag attached to that metadata field specifying in which language metadata in, is included. Um, Okay, thank you so much, Irina. Yeah, so we 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 really uh, it's 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 a good point to, moment to say that in, in addition to those five meetings, we actually had a lot of satellite meetings with different uh, uh, different groups. It's 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 been a really a fascinating journey. So, uh, ideas challenge. You know, traditionally we we, we did want to try some. We didn't want to write some code. We wanted to do some kind of Wikidata enrichment. And uh, one of the team members, Francisco Beris Beitia, wrote a script uh, and it's available on on GitHub that takes. Uh, uh, let's say a, an ePrince JSON LD output uh, from the repository. So this is a kind of a JSON uh, formatted metadata from a uh, repository and it uses uh, DBpedia Spotlight, which is a kind of, a, which is a, an automated uh, model, a AI model for like, annotating these abstracts um, with uh, DBpedia links, you know, uh, entities. Um, and then we, the script actually uses those, uh, uh, those DBpedia links to then uh, go to Wikidata and extract all of the different labels and all of the different languages that exist. So in essence, the script would take, uh, takes a, an export from a repository and creates very multilingual indexing of that content uh, with, uh, through, through, through DBpedia, Spotlight, Wikidata. Um, and I took this script uh, I, and modified it slightly to, uh, to accept a, a slightly different uh, JSON format uh, that was available for this specific data set, which is um, uh, around 3,000 publications in information visualization from different conferences or 30 years of conference uh, proceedings and in information visualizations. Um, I added uh, a the ability to sort of specify which particular language I wanted to be sort of indexed in uh, using, you know, like by forking Francisco script and uh, ran it on this data set to see what I would learn, what we would find. Um, and here you could see what it, it takes the title abstract and any of the author keywords and generates these French, uh, French language actually uh, indexing. Um, and uh, we learned that uh, in this experiment, you know, there's out of the 3,400 or so um, articles, uh, there was about 2,200 uh, entities that were annotated um, uh, with 95% confidence. Although of course these, the EPDA spotlight, it doesn't always get everything right. There is some uh, room for error. Uh, some of the concepts identified are, might be incorrect, like New York City, the band versus New York City, the city. Um, and things like that. And there is, you know, tweaking to DBpedia Spotlight that you can do to be, to try and get that matching more precise. And also the need for build, because uh, these, these automated systems rely on uh, training data. And so to, to build training data sets in different languages uh, and more, more precise ones. Anyway, for the French, uh, for moving into French, about 83% of that had French labels. Uh, there was also some ambiguity in that we were going from DBpedia to Wikidata. It showed some, um, it showed some uh, instances where there was multiple links uh, from DBpedia to Wikidata for certain concepts, which was interesting in itself. 
Um, so this is a visualization here of once you have this, of a kind of a co-concept map in, in French for this data set. And here you see uh, when you zoom in on a node uh, with that has this, this ambiguity present. So uh, for certain nodes, I had multiple labels in French because of the multiple links between the two uh, open data systems. And when looking, and in fact, information visualization uh, uh, was one of them. Uh, and uh, if you look at, to, to dig in, you know, for example, why you see, well, there is actually an ongoing debate about merging data visualization and information visualization. And um, the, so that's why in this case, there's actually this, uh, there are multiple links between the two systems. So, so it's, a, you know, it, it's good to remember that it's fluid. This, uh, these, uh, these data sources are changing, but uh, uh, you know, it was a relatively small percentage, just, just, just 4% that had this type of uh, ambiguity. Um, yeah, and so uh, I'm coming to the end of what we learned. I, I, we, uh, we also have uh, a, uh, in, in this presentation, which I will share, uh, you know, because it has a lot of good links. Uh, in terms of our script, uh, uh, probably would be better instead of using the public API to use the, the data bus, which has uh, kind of, uh, you could download the full data set. Uh, so for example, uh, uh, very specific sort of extracts and this one is uh, just all of the different labels in the different languages with correspondence between um, Wikidata. So it's a kind of extracted. So instead of making hundreds of calls to uh, the DB Spotlight, I mean, uh, to the Wikidata API um, or the DBpedia API to, uh, to extract things, it's, it's actually pre-extracted on a regular basis. Uh, this is the link for the DBpedia Spotlight that I mentioned. The, the, the models that exist is right now is in these languages, English, German, Dutch, French. So there's, and, and, and uh, you know, Portuguese, Hungarian. It's, this is the tool for, uh, sorry, for automatically annotating mentions um, you know, for, for annotations. And of course the question, well, why isn't there more languages? And because this is an open source tool, they, this community is in need of, uh, sorry, is in need of uh, uh, adding more. And so, you, you know, I think uh, one way we can contribute as a community is to train more models. It requires a corpus as uh, so specific to the language. Um, and so another uh, really interesting example is, uh, uh, is uh, an if is, is kind of a, it's a different, it's a similar tool to, uh, um, to um, DBpedia Spotlight. It was uh, developed uh, by the National Library of Finland and the, you know, for, the, for the Finnish language. And, uh, and here you see, and they've done some, some fantastic work actually in this, in this area. Um, and here you see on the slide, you see screenshots of results from an automated indexing from ANIF based on a Wikidata vocabulary. Um, and there's a related project to this launched uh, recently called Finto AI, which is, uses the general Finnish ontology um, as well. Um, and uh, it's based on the corpus from the national, in, in Finnish, Swedish, and English from the National Library of Finland. Um, and recently, uh, University of Vaskala, I hope I pronounced that right, submitting their master thesis to the JIX repository, get suggestions from ANIF uh, that they can use or modify before accepting them when submitting their, their, uh, their master's thesis, which is really great. Um, so in terms of controlled vocabularies, there's Cosmos, uh, and if uh, uses this to host their sort of controlled vocabulary and, 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 and others, uh, multilingual vocabulary, if you want to be, if, if, you, if you need a more controlled uh, multilingual vocabulary other than uh, Wikidata. Um, what else? Uh, so uh, this is slide actually borrows from, uh, um, Slava Tikolov, one of our team members who presented on the work that he's been doing with Dataverse and integrating Wikidata and Dataverse. And he uh, articulated here very nicely the, uh, the need for including the following subfields in order to be able to have uh, kind of a linked open data vocabularies as part of repositories. So the, the vocabulary name, the URL, the label term, and the term URL. And um, I would add to that list uh, the need to specify the language of the label as well. 
Um, and early on as well, uh, uh, the, uh, in our meetings, we identified really the need to uh, establish these are difficult challenges um, and, and we, we need to, they need to really uh, work within the kind of communities of practice around how to do this, how to do multilingual, how to improve um, uh, multilingual uh, access in repositories, how to improve linked open data integration in repositories. There are two, uh, two specific uh, existing communities of practice, but I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that we will, in, in, in essence, through open repositories, have our, our own as well. Uh, the translate wiki.net is, is a, a translation community and a localization platform for free and open source projects that started with translation of media wiki. This is kind of the crowdsource translation of interfaces for open systems. And uh, very recently launched uh, translationscience.org, uh, uh, which one of our team members is a part of. Uh, and uh, is, is, you know, they have a mailing list, a blog, and, and they're really looking to uh, share information and, and you know, on the breaking these barriers to, uh, to science through uh, using, uh, to, to increase really multilingual access. And I think, uh, these are the Ideas Challenge teamers to whom I thank very much. Um, and uh, thank you very much for, for listening to me. And I, I hope we can continue the discussion during the conference uh, of some of these topics. And it's really an open call to everyone who is interested, sir. Please join us, sir, because the reason I, I got involved, sir, it would be good to have some guidance for repository managers how to improve discoverability. Our colleague Kathleen from CORE is also on the team and uh, she's interested to produce some recommendations to repository managers, sir. So please, sir, join us, talk to us, sir, networking platforms, or let's get in touch for Slack or email. And uh, it was an exciting journey. And uh, we met a lot of people on it, and it would be good to, to be working with you as well if you're interested. And thanks a lot, Tomas, for driving it. Thank you, Thomas, and, and thank you, Irina, for, for sharing all of this. And as, as, as Jeremy said in, in his keynote, uh, it's, it's fascinating how, how, how you can dream of things and then see them happening. Uh, uh, throughout this year through collaboration. So this for me, it's, it's a fantastic example of what Ideas Challenge could be and what uh, this can represent for the open repository community. So I just uh, uh, echo what uh, both Thomas and Irina said uh, to all of you. So if you're interested or you have something to share, uh, join the conversation. Uh, we share in the chat uh, the information in the, to join it. and. Um, and if you have updates or you want to use the networking sessions also to discuss uh, new ideas, uh, we'll see you again uh, at the end of the conference. Uh, before uh, uh, closing this session, uh, uh, we have a few minutes more. So if you have questions for Thomas or Irina, please uh, uh, share them. And see you. Thank you. Uh, if not, um, we can move uh, to the next uh, session soon, Irina. And, uh, and again, uh, see, see you and I hope to hear lots of new ideas uh, on Thursday. Thanks a lot, Mick. Um, our next session starts in uh, 11 minutes, sir. And um, it will be a panel speaking up and speaking out who will shape the narrative for open access repositories, sir. And we have an excellent lineup of speakers, sir. Kathleen Shearer from CORE, Eloy Rodriguez from University of Minho, Johan Rurik from uh, Leiden University and Coalition S, and uh, Dominic Babini from uh, Clark. So, so let's let's take this 10 minutes break and uh, I'm handing over moderation to Leila, who will take over for the next session. And thanks for joining us. Let's Thank get a cup of tea or coffee. <laughs>